So, as I told you, he has won several prizes, the Physica Prize, ERC Advanced Grant, and others. He's doing wonderful stuff, and we are looking forward to hear today what he will tell us. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, no pressure. Um, uh, slightly intimidated by the large fraction of uh, people with theoretical backgrounds in the audience. Um, <laughs> And um, let me start by, by disappointing you. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to talk about the quantum material. Uh, however, I am going to try to say, say, uh, show you my fun in a photonic analog of topological crystals, where if we play with the topology of the of the, the, the band structure of photonic crystals, we can actually make topological edge states and play with them the way people in solid state physics are used to playing, but then with electrons. And the question is, where does the analogy break down? Um, what's useful, what, what can we port from the electron system to the photonic system, and, and, and what can't we port. So, as Christiane mentioned, I'm, I'm now currently in, in Delft, where I'm in the, the Department of Quantum Nanoscience, where we work on, also on quantum matter, but also quantum sensing and on the mysterious quantum transduction. Um, of course, we're always looking for people. Um, most important slide, I'm going to talk about work which I do in complete symbiosis with the group of Ewald Verhaeghe at the Von Institute Amel. So it's really a co-production, we share work discussions, etc. Um, so um, I would like to thank Ewald and his group, and in particular Lene Barchit, who uh, obtained his PhD uh, two and a half weeks ago, and also the members from my group, Sonakshi Aurora, PhD student who obtained her PhD one and a half weeks ago, Thomas Bauer, Prikipa Apajani, uh, two postdocs, and Nico Parakura, to share PhD students between me and Eos Verhagen. So, what will I be talking about? I'll have a short introduction which will probably offend most of the theoreticians in the audience. Then I will talk about the quantum spin hole mimicking photonic crystal system where Christiane will take issue with the name calling, but this is just the community that calls it that way. And I will, I will talk about spin momentum locking in this system, or not. Um, and then I will change to the quantum value hole mimicking system, where I will show robust propagation, and then discuss the question, how robust is this propagation? And then I'll switch gears completely and talk about Landau levels um, in, in a photonic crystal. And I end with some obvious conclusions. So, just to get you up to speed, if we have two gap systems and we have systems with a different right, global topological invariant, if I bring them together, something has to happen in the interface to close the gap. Um, and what you get from the, the, the Bob boundary on this principle is you get edge states that propagate only along the interface between those two. And I was pissed off if you didn't know. Okay. The funky bit, the funky thing about these, these states is that typically in the electronic system is they propagate only in one direction if they have a certain spin typically. And if you flip the spin, they will propagate in the opposite direction. And they cannot just propagate, right? They cannot couple to each other. Um, and that's why they're often called protected edge states. So there's something which in photonics we then call topological protection or robustness to scattering. And we know the quantum spin hole effect where, where you have states um, where spin orbit coupling then breaks breaks time reversal symmetry, or you have an external magnetic field in the in the in the in the, in the quantum hole effect, um, 
where you get these states with only one spin propagating along the interface. And of course, uh, this was hot in electronics, and of course, immediately people from Photonic jumped onto the bandwagon, designing new systems that would mimic the quantum spin hole effect. And the, the, the big name here is, is Havesi in particular. And other people, uh, Monty Segev, Alex Omite, who started designing systems that mimic the quantum hole effect. Um, and we did, we did our own version of, of, of this. And so here is the first, right, the first structure that I'm going to talk about. And this is a, a quantum spin hole mimicking system with an edge state in the middle. Um, you might not be able to see it properly, so I pointed out here. And then this, this doesn't help very much either. So let's zoom in. So what is this lattice? This is a lattice of triangular holes drilled in honeycomb lattice, right? So there's there's six triangles with the, the points of the of the pi, the points of the triangles pointing towards each other in hexagons. Um, and there's a difference between, say, the hexagons here, where the, the, the I should point for the people online. So these hexagons, right, all the pieces of the pie are pulled out of the center. But on this side, right, the pieces of the pie are actually pushed into each other. And that creates a topological difference between the right-hand side of this crystal and the left-hand side of the crystal. So if you have a system where the, the, the piece of the pie are just in their in their their the, the simple simple most honeycomb like lattice then the dispersion curve of the system is is uh, calculated here it's a, a fourfold degenerate uh, Dirac cone crossing at the gamma point however if you now start shoving in these triangles or pulling them out you get two different systems. First of all, is in both cases, you open up a topological gap. And in the left, uh, yes, so in the, in the left, uh, say, uh, lattice, um, you have a trivial system. So the, the states in the conduction band, they are D-like. And the states in, in the, 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 the valence band are P-like. And we know that we denote that by uh, say giving them a certain width. Because the states live close to the gamma point, which means that they can radiate to, to the far field. And a P state radiates more than a D state because of symmetry. On the other hand, if you pull out the triangles, then you get band inversion. So the P-like states are now in the conduction bands and the D-like states are in the valence band. And that means because of the band inversion or because of the difference in, in topological invariant, in this case it's a churn number, something is going to happen at the interface between those, between those lattices. Um, interestingly, because in this case, all the magic happens at the gamma point. The, and I should point it out that we make these, these crystals in a clean room, and they're made in a two-dimensional slab of silicon. Right? So this is a two-dimensional system, which means if I now have states near the gamma point, they have a very low wave vector, in-plane wave vector. Which means just with Snell's law, they can radiate to the far field. So we can use far field microscopy to study them. <coughs> so here I show you apparatus that we use to, to study them. So it's, it's actually an objective lens. So laser comes in, we play with the polarization, we excite the states, and we look what comes back. And 
the light that comes back, we put into a monochromator so that we can measure the frequency of the light. And the light that comes in is, say, white light. It's a white light laser, as it were. So immediately we can get the frequency response of the system. We can see what frequencies are available. But we play one more trick. We don't do microscopy of the, of the system. We actually image what's called the back focal plane of the system. And that means that we get information about wave vectors inside the structure. So for the people in the audience who are familiar with RPES, for example, it's very similar. We get immediately the relation between wave vector on the one hand and omega on the other hand, which means we can map the dispersion of all these states. And so we did that. And then here, oh, this screen is really poor. Uh, I have a much better, better image. Oh, that screen is also much better. <laughs> we cannot control the light. We cannot control the light, really? Oh, okay, so that's the way. Okay, so. This will be changed in the near future. Okay, so. So for the people online who can properly see this, you see two straight lines forming a cross in the middle of this image. And those two lines are the edge states that I was talking about. You also see these, these dark fringes. Forget about that. Those are fabi Perot resonances in the system. Not important. But these states in the middle are the predicted edge states. Uh, that were predicted. And interestingly, we can do more than just <coughs> see where the states are. We can also measure what the optical spin is of these states. We can just measure because optical spin in, in means what is the circular polarization of the light that's coming off. So we can measure what the polarization of the light is that comes off. Oh, I should have. Okay, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to point out something much more important uh, before that. If you really look carefully at Andrew's calculated lines, you see that this is not a nice cross. Mm -hmm. And if you look at our measurements, you actually see that it's really a bit of a, a, a yeah, lengthened bit of crossing. If you now make a cut through that, you actually see a wiggle. We don't have a proper crossing of these states. We have an anti-crossing of these states. And in the measurements, we see an anti-crossing of the states of roughly one terahertz. And if we look into our calculations, we find that we also have. So even in theory, we have an anti-crossing. It's smaller, right? Because it's a perfect structure in our computer. But it's still there. So this state, right? These states already exhibit spin-spin scattering. Right? And why is that? Because by making the interface between the two lattices, we break the C6 symmetry, which gives the bulk its topology. Right? So, so, so by, by, by making the interface, we're actually breaking, by design, the topological protection. And this is an important point, because we make these structures in silicon. And silicon does not have, say, gyroscopic interactions. So there is no coupling between the electric field and the magnetic field of the light waves, which means that this system is fully reciprocal. So we cannot break time reversal symmetry, which you can with an electron spin and a magnetic field, or with an electron spin and spin orbit coupling. And that means that the, the topological protection that I'm talking about today relies fully on symmetry. And it will never be perfect. But of course, there are people in the world that promise that it would be perfect. And that's why perhaps there's such a large time lag between us putting things in archive and actually getting it published. 
But okay, I'm just speculating, right? Um, now onto the spin. So we can measure, right, the spin of the light coming off from the structure. So here you see the states again, and here I've color coded it in the so-called third Stokes parameter, which tells you how circularly polarized the light field coming off is. And so if it's red, it means it is right-handed circularly polarized fully. If it's one, right, Stokes parameter one, perfectly circularly polarized light. Um, and if it's minus one, then it's left-handed circularly polarized. So there is a one-to-one -one mapping of <coughs> spin to propagation direction, right? Because this has a positive group velocity, so it's propagating from left to right, and it has a positive spin. But if you have a negative spin, you have the mode which is propagating in the opposite direction, right? So there's a direct coupling between momentum and optical spin. As yes, a small thing you can see in electronic terms, but photonic terms is other. As you also see the balance band there in the in the figure, and yes. it's not in the right figure. Did you look to the spin polarization too of that part? Uh, yes, but it was hard to, so it, it was a mess. Well, honest answer, it was a mess, yes. Uh, so if you have spin, spin momentum coupling, right, people immediately start thinking about doing quantum optics, right? Because there's spin changing transitions, right? That you make with circular polarized light so either the absorption or, or the emission now becomes directional. So people thought about right putting quantum dots in these structures near the edge, and then right a quantum dot that wants to emit sigma minus light would only emit into the edge state which propagates in this direction, and quantum dot which would want to emit sigma plus would only emit in this direction. And of course, if you, right, okay, so I'm being really critical, so don't send this video out, right, to the rest of the world. And of course, it sounds very nice, right? Is it also true? No. And I'm going to show that to you. But in order to do that, you have to realize that what I showed you now was the light escaping from the edge state to the far field, right? It was only the, the, the light which made it out to the far field. It was only the low spatial frequency components of those edge states. But I also have a near field microscope which allows me to map the wave functions with, right, uh, with sub wavelength resolution, not only can I use this technique to map the amplitude with some wavelength spatial resolution? And here you see the amplitude of, of one of these states, and you see that the amplitude decays because it's radiating to the far field, so it's losing energy. But we can also determine what the S3 is, but now not in the far field, but in the near field. So I'm going to speed up a little bit so we have the near field. We can now, from this data, construct the far field because we can just limit in Fourier analysis, limit Fourier filter out all the high spatial frequencies. Then you get this image. And we can do the same for the spin. So this is the measured far field spin of this state. And this was the state which propagates from left to right. And as you can see, the Stokes parameter is almost one. Can I see the previous slide again? I was trying to take a photo. Ah. <laughs> uh, so here you see immediately see the spin momentum locking that we also already published, right? Mm -hmm. We have we have mainly red here, nice circular polarization for the left to right location. If you look carefully, but it's only visible on the screen in the back of the room, you already see a little bit of blue here. So it's not the whole no. story. No. If I now show you 
what the actual wave function looks like and what the spin density of the states is, you see that it's textured. You have pockets of high S3, but you also have pockets of high, but then negative S3. So you have both almost perfect circular polarization in one location, but less than a wavelength away, you have the opposite spin. Which means that these people in the science paper, they must have done post-selection of the data or know exactly within nanometer accuracy whether or not their quantum dot was living here or here. So this shows right, that the spin momentum locking actually breaks down if you look at the wave function at the local level. So these are calculations that show that we're doing a good job. And it's even worse. If you look at the far field spin, then we have a nice locking that I said. Red goes from left to right, and blue goes from right to left. If I now take all the spatial frequencies into account, oh yes, and the slope parameter is minus one to plus one. Beautiful. If I now take all the spatial frequencies into account, so I integrate it for all spatial frequencies, the entire wave function, the spin actually flips. You have blue, roughly blue actually becomes red here. You have blue going from left to right, and red going from right to left. And of course, the Stokes parameter is nowhere near circular polarization. It's almost linear if you average everything, because there's pockets of red and blue everywhere. Yes. But it, if you look to your maps, it looks like you have two modes counter propagating. Because one is at, uh, let's say, the trigonal crossing points, and the other is at the center of the. Yeah. The so interesting two, thing is. Two type of orbitals. <coughs> yes. And, and the funny thing is, this is. Selected, we can we, we have phase information, so we can select only the modes propagating from left to right, and those we show here. It's all left to right, yeah, and only uh, in the calculations as well. And yes, the the, the 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 center of mass of the state is not at the edge; it is in one of the one of the lattices. So you, yes, well spotted. <coughs> Uh, I realized that if I, so in order to explain the spin flip, you actually need to take all the spatial frequencies of the, of the state into account. Um, and I need to speed up tremendously if I want to finish my talk. So switch immediately to the value hole system. So if you think about applications of what I just said, this spin hole mimicking system is crap, right? Because it radiates energy away to the far field, so that's not good. So meanwhile, while we were working on this, a different design, different topological system came out, which is the value hole mimicking system. So here the basis is, is say, a, a graphene-like lattice, where you now change the size of the holes to break inversion symmetry. And here you see two lattices attached to each other, which are each, each mirror image, right? And then you get states at the interface. And now they're defined by a, a value pseudo spin, which then determines in which direction they propagate. And if we now measure these states with our mirror microscope, you immediately see that we have a nice propagation over many microns without loss of any, any intensity. And that is because these states have a wave vector which is so high that it can, they cannot escape their properly guided modes, which cannot uh, radiate to the far field. And the funny thing is, we can measure the dispersion relation, right? We can, we can measure the state, look at the spatial frequencies in the propagation direction, and do that for all frequencies. So then we measure the dispersion relation in our measurement. And you see many dispersion relations. Right? You see 
So we actually have six dispersion relations if we do the measurement. And so why is this? So this is what some people in small states forget, is that actual wave functions in a solid state are not sines and cosines. They have a shape which is multiplied, right, which has to repeat with A. It's not necessarily cosine, which means I need more higher order spatial frequencies. OK, so these are red dots space 2 pi over a apart and together if you add them all together and then Fourier transform them back then you get the wave function that can actually live in the structure if you take only one you would only only have a cosine wave and now you see that we have forward propagating but you of course will also have already noticed then we have backward propagating waves. So we can separate forward from backward propagating waves. So we can now also test how well is this topological protection working, right? How well, right, is the topological protection working against backscattering into, into the, from left, right to right, left, etc. So we built a structure, right, of the valuable system here, and we made a trapezoid. And here you see a measurement. This is not a simulation. This is a measurement of light propagating right, along the trapezoid. So even though the light encounters these corners, it goes around the corners without any loss. And if you compare this to an old-fashioned photonic crystal that I worked on 15 years ago, same type of structure, you immediately see that we have more intensity here than you have here. So every corner, you lose intensity. Because here, we have no topological protection. And so if we now use, say, say a transfer model system, we can actually figure out that this, the topologically protected system has a two orders of magnitude smaller reflection at these corners than the conventional system. Yes. There's no actual dissipation or leaking of the light. Yeah. Good question. So, <coughs> in principle, there is no leakage away from the structure because all the, the, the wave vectors are too large. Of course, if you make a corner, you break translational symmetry so there will at the corner there will be some radiation right out mm -hmm. so that is taken into account into the losses so we have the reflection coefficient which is in the backward propagating mode and we have losses at each corner and even the losses are less mm -hmm. however i did play a trick on you making corners in well-defined crystallographic directions protects the symmetry of the system. So these are actually, there are corners which, which, which maintain right, the symmetry of the system. And therefore, people might argue you're cheating right, because you're, you're, you're maintaining the symmetry that protects against backscattering. And to study whether or not that's the case, we decided, well, let's take just one straight bit of waveguide and introduce disorder on purpose, right? And we can just put the holes in different places. We can make them slightly bigger, slightly smaller. And we did this in yet another system, in the so-called bearded interface. So here you see the value hole system. But at the interface, you see that we have small triangles, and we have shifted the two value systems half a letter space with respect to each other. Right? So it's it, it has a, a glide plane symmetry. And if you do that, and this is the measured dispersion curve, you now again get edge states, but you get two. And the funny thing is. You get one which is called, which is non-trivial, 
and you get one which the people who made this design, a group of Ima Prima Moto in, in Tokyo, called trivial. And why did they say this? Well, because if you adiabatically change the size of the center holes, you see that this mode actually drops down from the conduction map. And thereby, they said, well, this is trivial, but this was already there, crossing the gap. So this is a non-trivial one. So now, in one system, we have one topological gap. And now we can immediately compare trivial to non-trivial modes. And you see, and that's really funky if you think about it, the states no longer have a linear dispersion. They actually have a dispersion which changes the functional frequency. So we also have a change in the group velocity. We can slow down the light as we go to this point. And so first we took the pristine, perfect structure, and we just shone in light. And so what, what we did is we measure along the center of the waveguide, again and again and again. And here you see the measured amplitude. And then we change frequency. So this is at pi over a, where the modes have a degeneracy point. But the zero here, and here we have the non-trivial bit, and here we have the trivial bit. And so this already for the community, and actually also for me, if I'm honest, is where life is disappointing. Because you see that if you're far away from the degeneracy point, you see that life is okay-ish, right? Um, you have life which crosses your entire structure, uh, which is nice. But as you approach the degeneracy point, as light slows down, you see that it doesn't go that far. And actually, if you look at many of these type of structures, you see that there are high intensity spikes here, indicating that we have anti Because, let me be clear, we have a reciprocal sample, which cannot be perfect. It is one dimensional. So we know one dimensional system with disorder always will lead to localization. The question is on what length scale? And here we see that it already happens here. What we try to do a little bit better, so we now only consider the fast bits in this measurement. And in these, in these fast bits, we can see how <coughs> the intensity decays as a function of position. And from that, we can determine the backscattering mean free path. Right? And so, the, so, so if the backscattering mean free path psi is big, that means light will go far, and so the scattering is low. And so we did that while changing disorder. So no disorder is here. And this is only fast light. And here we change, oh crap, position disorder, right? Which is normalized to, to, uh, to the, the, the lattice spacing. And here we change size disorder of the holes. And then you see two important things. The non-trivial bit always has a higher mean free path than the trivial bit. So there is some topological protection. The topological protection is not infinite. Actually, it is only a factor of two to three. And as you increase this order, the topological protection completely caves very quickly. And why is that? Because by introducing this disorder, you're immediately messing up the symmetries that are actually protecting the system. <coughs> and now for something completely different. Imagine an electron. And it propagates in space. And there's a relation between the energy and the wave vector. If I now introduce a magnetic field, the Lorentz force will start turning the electron around. 
And of course, at a certain stage, there will be closed orbits where you have resonances leading to lambda levels. Right? So, so for certain energies, the wave function of the electron will constructively interfere with itself, and you get resonances that are called lambda levels. And there's a certain level spacing for free electrons that go like this. If you now take massless direct particles, you could do the same thing, right? You would have lambda levels, but then the spacing would be different. But it would be with the square root of, of say, the quote-unquote magnetic field. And it was realized that in, okay, so I messed this up. So the question now is, can we do this for photons, right? As I said, magneto-optic materials are a challenge. Well, we can play a trick, and that is, instead of having a proper gauge field, which leads to a magnetic field, we might make a synthetic gauge field. And already for graphene, it was realized that if you strain graphene, this strain will have the effect of a magnetic field, leading to lambda well levels. And photonics, so Mikael Rexman realized, well, we can do the same for photonic crystals, right? We can just strain a photonic crystal and then also create, hopefully, lambda levels. And this was done in a variety of different systems. And we thought, well, we can do that too, right? These were wave cavities, wave guides. We thought, let's do this in a proper photonic crystal. So this is are strained photonic crystals. Mm -hmm. So at the center of the structure, you realize you, you meet, see these beautiful graphene-like patterns. But as you go away from the center, you see that we distort right, the lattice. We, we actually pull everything up here, and we pull everything up here. So in effect, we're creating a magnetic field. And then we did the same thing that we did before. We measure the far field. And lo and behold, you see in the gap, you see these flat bands appear, just like the lambda levels, right, in graphene. And these are the calculations. We had to play a trick. In order to get the light out, I won't, I won't bother you with that. I want to make a photograph, right? Okay. <laughs> and of course, we can play with the strain. So as we increase the strain, so here you see, so I think Daniel will have seen here, this bulk band and this bulk band. You see actually the topological gap becoming bigger. And you also see that you get more states in the gap. And in fact, we're increasing the, the magnetic field. And we see roughly that we have the square root behavior of the level spacing as a function of strain. Oh, yeah, it's important to point out that while we were doing this work, we realized that the group of uh, Mikhail Rechtsman who's actually a friend of ours, was doing exactly the same thing. Uh, so we, instead of competing with each other, we decided to send our, our papers uh, to Nation Photonics at the same time. Uh, at this stage, we heard that ours is, was accepted last week. We don't know about their paper yet. <laughs> Hopefully, theirs is accepted as well. Um, and then we thought, OK, let's, let's play a different game. So this was based on a theory paper where they strain graphene in different opposite directions. And that means that you get two systems with an opposite quote-unquote magnetic field, creating or necessitating edge states right? at, at the place where the magnetic field is zero. And the, the, right, the idea of, that, that you can think of is that you're now creating states at the interface which couple the different lambda levels. 
and thereby mimicking the spin hole system better. And so we did that as well. So here's our system. So here, everything is straight up like the previous one, and here everything is straight in the opposite direction. And here you now see that we no longer have flat systems, but we have these, these structures that look like the mouth of the Joker in, in Batman, right? <laughs> Uh, right, these are nasty smiley faces. <laughs> and from calculations, calculations actually show that we don't have these proper lambda levels with states coupling them. We just have these, right, these, these edge states uh, in the gap. And with this, I come to my conclusions. So hopefully I've convinced you that topological photonics is, is interesting. We had photonic edge states where we had coupling right between spin and momentum. And then I showed that actually life is more complicated. We had a breakdown of, of spin helicity logging. We showed you uh, that if you preserve symmetry, you actually have very good protection against topological, uh, against backscattering. But if you don't, it actually breaks down. And I showed you that we can uh, that we can make lambda levels uh, in photonic systems as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Corbus, for this fascinating talk. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I want to know a little bit about the let's say secret sauce about making these crystals and cross checks. Like, how thick are they? And you just have a machine just goes in and How does it actually work? Okay, so the first thing is uh, they are slabs of uh, 200, roughly 220 nanometers thick silicon. And what you buy from a company are wafers, which are called SOI wafers, silicon on insulator wafers, which are this layer of silicon that we want, a layer of silicon oxide glass on a thick bulk silicon. And these are used in the semiconductor industry. And so then what we do is we use uh, lithography in the clean room. So not punching holes, but with, with electron beam resist, making a pattern. So we do electron beams. And then using, uh, say, uh, wet chemistry to etch into the silicon with, uh, in uh, uh, KOH, if I'm not mistaken. And then after we've punched the holes into the top layer, we then dunk the entire thing in HF, which then takes away the glass, which is below. And if you time that right, you only remove the glass below uh, the silicon with the holes, and not everywhere, so that you have a freestanding membrane of 200 nanometers air, and then below the bulk silicon. So the things that I told you not to look at, the, the dark fringes, are resonances because light can reflect from the top silicon, but also travel three microns into and then come back. And that creates a reparole interference. Yes. Yes, please, Daniel. Uh, you showed that, uh, in fact, uh, for your system, the, well, the, the, the edge states or boundary states, uh, they do not, they do not uh, survive disorder. Mm -hmm. right. I think that's typical for a crystal, crystalline topological insulator. Yes. Um, uh, because if it would be really fun to spin all insulator, it should not yes. be the case. But uh, we studied it in the valley hole system. Yeah. So does that's, that make a difference for you? That, that, that I can ask you, I didn't think about it. Yeah, but, but so, so, we, so because the, the we only studied in the valley hole system because, in principle, there you don't have propagation losses yeah. because the spin hole system, right? Uh, the, the the states have can can couple to radiation, so they have a Q of 300. So after 300 oscillations of the electric field, they're already gone. So we didn't do any disorder studies there yeah. because that's meaningless because you lose the light too fast. In so in the electronic system, Christian and uh, Ingmar studied a uh, uh, calculated lattice yeah. so that uh, yeah. you get edge states, but you need to put symmetry. Uh, yeah. 
at the edges to, to see the estates and there is one with the bear uh, zigzag and one with the uh, what do you call it? The, mm -hmm. yeah. the, 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 other, yeah, the, the other one and, and, and so it's, that's maybe why they call this a weak top loss because it's on the other hand the gap can be made stronger than any quantum spin hole insulator because yeah. it's, so, it's just question of geometry it's nice yes so 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 we use in photonics we use similar language right so so as i said topological protection that we get is from the symmetry of the lattice right because we cannot right we have no proper magnetic field um, which means that any mistake that you make in in the structure in principle it already breaks the symmetry right but then the question arises, if I now place one atom in a hole of one nanometer in the wrong place, right? Is that a strong enough distortion of symmetry to do something? And then the, 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 the hand wavy reasoning is, well, if that, if you use first order perturbation, if that doesn't move the states an amount bigger than the topological gap, you're fine. But you know that that it is already scattering. Yeah. So that brings me to the next question. Yes. Is there an analog of a real quantum spin all effect? So which is initiated by spin orbit coupling and not by lattice symmetry um, in the photonic, uh, uh, photonic so world. To the best of my knowledge, yes. Uh, but then for microwaves, okay. where you can, right, where you can have a much stronger uh, coupling between electric and magnetic fields, so then you can properly break time reversal symmetry, and I think they did that first in the in the spin wall mimicking system. Yes. Yeah. But for but for opti optical frequencies, telecom like we study, forget yeah. about it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you do the the strain, I know we talked to the strain when you have a pseudo magnetic field. It's like plus B in the honeycomb. That's mm -hmm. what uh, that's an also in DNA I studied. It's like plus B for the K mm -hmm. wave vector and minus B for the K prime. Mm -hmm. And why should you expect them flat on our levels for for this pseudo on our levels? They are not really flat. Right? They are not really flat, but but also, so so here you already see that they're not properly flat, and that's uh -huh. that's because the strain only approximates uh, a magnetic field in uh -huh. right to first order. So they're flattish for small k vectors, and then they, they curl away. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if I can have one more question. So um, they had these experiments uh, for bilayer graphene, mm -hmm. where they could see the, the some kind of uh, uh, fractal structure in the, in the quantum Hall effect. I think I've heard about this Philip Kim twist yes, bilayers. Yes, yes, but not. I was not wondering there. whether one could do similar things here. Because when I look at your structure, it looks a bit like the experiment by Ingmar. When he, but Ingmar had a ribbon, and he was anchoring his ribbon, a graphene ribbon. Uh -huh. He was anchoring, and then he was with the tip of the STM bending it yeah. in the plane yeah. to get the, the deformations. And it looks a bit like what Ingmar had, but now not in a ribbon, but on a larger structure. I, I would love to, I think, I mean, maybe we should just try it. But there's, there's, there's the, if you actually think about our structures, right, 200 nanometers silicon, 200 nanometers silicon, uh -huh. if you bring them close uh -huh. and you want to, to have them nice and, and uh, clean, then Van der Waals forces will glue them together like there's no tomorrow. Right, so actually fabricate. So I think that the poking that Ingmar did is going to be yeah. really hard. But we might, because they're also bigger, take a, a robot arm, right, and, and properly. But, but then we need to get the angle right, and then just 
and then it would stick. Ah, to, to do some rotation. In it would, yeah. I mean, these, these structures are, are right, are uh, tens of microns big, right? So they're, 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 they're big. Um, so, so then, right then, then with with a micro manipulator that you have, for example, that you can have in a, in a scanning electron microscope, it might be feasible. But it's easy for me as a supervisor to say that to a PhD student to actually right, make a flake rotate and then pop them down. Uh -huh. it would be really cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Yes. So, <clears throat> is this only possible for silicon or also for materials? In, pr in principle, any material that you can make a photonic crystal in, you can so, work. And so, would you interface two materials? Um, because what, what would happen if you have two materials with different refractive indices? Yes. And then if you interface two trace materials? Um, okay, so. It's important to realize that we're already playing with two materials, right? The photonic crystal band, the, 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 the dispersion curves, right? The photonic bands, they come about by us using two really different materials, the silicon and the air that we punch holes with, right? So if you, if you now consider making a photonic crystal in silicon and then attaching it to a photonic crystal made in silicon nitride or glass, with, which has a much lower index. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not that funky. It's, 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 uh, you have smaller gaps. You have some coupling. I don't expect any, any, any funky physics on that, on that. It will just be some Snell's law, which bulk, which, which bulk stays coupled to bulk stays in the other. Because uh, there's no, uh, yeah. That's, that's what I expect to happen. Yeah, maybe one question was also issues of higher orbitals. Mm -hmm. Because when I look at your red and blue pictures, usually if you would have like few orbitals, mm -hmm. the intensity is not on sides, but it's between sides, mm -hmm. right? So how is the... How is this all described by S orbitals or by P orbitals? What kind of orbitals do you have? Um, so in the spin hole system, we could yeah there um, we could uh, map the mainly the calculated wave functions mainly on P and D orbital. P. But what you see actually, if you look at at the the the, the mm -hmm. detail here. There's actually much more detail to these states than just uh, P and D. Now, of course, I'm cheating a bit because this is this is the spin texture. Yeah, I don't have the calculated amplitude, um, uh -huh. but we could we could do most of the stuff by by, by considering P and D. I see. So on each side, you have P and D. Um, okay. We only looked at the interface. I have, to, I, I take, I, I, I take a fifth of this, and I will do my own. Yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. Was this the perfect resolution that was made by like this line for me? Mm-hmm. So when can you also realize higher order of particle phases in such materials, or it's only normal particle phases? Uh, so, so there are uh, uh, a number of people, uh, uh, Mohammed Havezi and uh, oh, somebody in, in New York, uh, in the vicinity of Andrea Alou, who are also considering higher order uh, topological phases, just based on symmetry of, right, of, of, of the topos, yes. I should know, because I'm... Always telling referees and papers not to send to them. Okay, fine. Any yeah. other questions? Can I ask a very yes. general yes. question? Yes. I was wondering for nanophotonics, what is kind of the, the holy grail with this sort of thing? So, so the, the holy grail that was promised was um, lossless propagation of light without any backscattering. Mm -hmm. So, yet. Uh, say the hope that we could use photonic crystals for 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 new optical chips. 
Um, and I think that amongst others, our study showed, well, that you might be able to improve chips of tonic crystals, which are too difficult anyway. Uh, so for me, it's 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 the physics that that interests me yeah, yeah, because sure. by now I think we are cutting through the hype. Uh, but but the, but 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 the idea, and that's why lots of people jumped on it, is that there would be uh, a couple of new paradigms where you could improve photonic chips. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the idea. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Any questions? Okay, so now let's take Globus again.